everyone and welcome to another Kerbal Space Program video. Uh, in this video we're going to be starting out with a time lapse much like we did last episode just because I got some good feedback from people that said they appreciated the time lapses but if you'd rather not sit through the time lapse then there will be a time code on screen to skip to if you want to just get down to the launch. But what is it we're building? Well to kind of break this thing down from the very beginning we're going to be building something that adds something more to the Life on Lathe series I'm currently doing, which I started last week. So Life on Lathe, for those that don't know, is my series in which we're going to be unlocking all the mysteries and kind of unknown surrounding Jules' innermost satellite and probably most interesting moon in the whole Kerbin system. Um, that is, of course, Lathe. We're going to be seeing why it possesses all of its unusual properties and, you know, running into some surprises, possibly along the way. But we can't really initiate any experiments until we establish some sort of presence. Enter today's video. We're going to be building a surface base on Lathe. I say surface base because although most of Lathe's surface is ocean, it does have some sandy islands. This base will sit on one of these islands. Of course, it would probably be useful to have some ocean surveying kind of colonies as well. So we will also be sending an ocean base down to the oceans as well in this episode but that's going to kind of take a secondary stage to uh, the main bit which is the surface which is like the land-based colony the ocean colony we've actually already sent up into space actually uh, the more keen-eyed among you may have noticed that there was something resembling something that could float like a floating structure incorporated into the massive lathe colony that we sent to low lathe orbit that's because now that we're going to be sending down a surface colony we can start deconstructing the orbital station into its main components which are the actual orbital laboratory and then the ocean lander so the whole base will split into two and the ocean lander will obviously go and land on the ocean leaving just the surface station in orbit. So all very exciting things this episode. I hope you enjoy it. And of course, enjoy all of the subsequent missions of this jolly old series I'm doing. Uh, I'm not. It's not going to be like the only thing I upload to this channel. Maybe next week we'll do something that isn't to do with life on Lathe. But I think it's got some poten good potential. You know, it's like Expedition Eve, which was a very similar premise, but obviously uh, made in the style of a movie rather than, you know, my normal commentaries. It wasn't not every mission went to Eve, and so, you know, with this series, not every mission will necessarily be all about Lathe. So, strap in and get ex ready. <laughs> I didn't script this video. <laughs> Although most of the stuff you can see me adding in the time lapse, like all these science modules, are functional, for the most part, this is all kind of meant to be aesthetic rather than, I guess, purely functional. It is a form was the priority here, just because... You know, this is kind of a more of a role-playing thing rather than being an actually useful mission. At the end of the day, on, on this save, this is a science mode save. It's not sandbox, but I have the entire tech tree unlocked. So there's not really that much motivation to get actual science points. It's more just, you know, the the fun of playing this. Like, before I had a YouTube channel and just played this game for quote-unquote fun, I guess I still play it for fun, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Um, I would just make up little missions like this in my head because I'm a massive nerd like that, I guess, where I'm like, let's just pretend that this is the scenario we have to work with. And I did this all the time when I was growing up as well. When I was playing, like, Grand Theft Auto, I would just make up little missions in my head when I was driving around. I don't know. Is this something that a lot of people do, or is this just a weird thing that I do and did and still do, kind of? Uh, let me know below if I'm a complete freak or if you're a freak like me. And with that... You can see that uh, we've finished building the actual surface base now. I've added those big heat shields there just to make our aero brakes more effective and also just to help uh, make sure this thing doesn't explode upon entry in Lathe's atmosphere. Well, then we're just going to go and build the uh, fuel tank structure around it. So I wanted to add an aerodynamic nose cone to the front of this ship. Admittedly, it won't do much because it doesn't exactly fully occlude the surface base structure, but at least it makes it look a little bit more rocket shaped for the sake of aesthetics in this video. I've made these fuel tanks to support it, although in reality that thing's actually not attached to anything. I just added some structural panels there to give the illusion it was attached. We can fade across to the actual launch now and welcome everyone that skipped the time lapse. I didn't talk about much, you'll be pleased to know. Like, like I ever talk about anything of in these videos, but especially, oh, I, I reached new lows. I reached new lows of not talking about anything. So, fairly standard ascent. We're going to be doing a basic gravity turn, aiming to be pointing about 45 degrees by the time we reach 10 kilometers up in the atmosphere. Nothing too new there. I just have to be careful because, as you may be able to see, this thing is woefully uh, un-aerodynamic. It's a fairly similar looking rocket actually to the one I used in the previous episode. So it, it's, it's a little bit less overbuilt because the payload is not quite as heavy so we didn't need as 
many side boosters for that first stage there, but it has the same sort of uh, midpoint goiter that masks the uh, the engines of the upper stage. But you know, it's a it's a good it's a good rocket, guys. We know it works. Let's not change something that we know works. Although I couldn't put a fairing around this one because while the payload is lighter, it's far far wider. So I couldn't really get a good way. I mean, maybe I don't actually know how wide the stock fairing is to be built. Uh, I'm pretty sure. It might have been possible to put a fairing around it, but I thought it might be a bit weird. It would probably look better if I just left it exposed like that. And besides, it does give us the opportunity to see how the components on this thing will withstand heating tolerance, which, are, you know, is a big thing when we're entering late atmosphere. I'd rather find out now if things are going to start disintegrating when exposed to any kind of heating whilst we're still at Kerbin, to any, any engineering errors or redesigns found to be required. It's going to be far more convenient to do it at this sort of stage, we haven't already done a massive space flight. It would be very quick to just redesign this thing on Kerbin and get it scrambled ready for another launch on Kerbin. So there we go, there's the surface base as it blazes through the upper parts of the atmosphere and we can watch the last of those plasma flames disappear and get our way on the way. So the, the second stage was very probably a bit, bit too overbuilt, we didn't really need those four vectors there. I wasn't really sure what kind of thrust weight ratio we'd be needing to get this thing kind of into space in time, so I just said let's go for more engines than we might necessarily need. So we probably could have got away with just a Rhino engine for this stage and then we wouldn't need to add that kind of mid-stage fairing to cover up the thick, uh, the thicker kind of Saturn V adapter halfway up, but regardless it doesn't really matter too much. We ended up with just the right amount of Delta V to do what we needed to do, so it was okay. So as you can see that stage is now gone, we are left with the final stage that's going to get us first of all circularized at Kerbin and then well on our way to Joule and eventually Lath as well. Um, I say stage, it's actually two stages but I'm going to be deploying the like structural fuel tanks and that nose cone fuel tank fairly late on in the mission quite a while after they've been drained of their fuel just because I don't want to be dumping them in space I want to make sure they are going to be they're going to be destroyed by crashing into uh, one celestial body or another. So I debated doing this in two, two different ways, really. The first method I thought of was, um, well, I guess there was three ways, actually, come to think of it now. I could have done two escape burns from Kerbin, one to get us just to the edge of Kerbin's, at Kerbin's sphere of influence, but not completely leave it, which takes about a thousand meters per second of delta V, which also happens to be about the same amount of delta V in those fuel tanks that we'd be ditching. I could then warp my way up to Apoapsis, decelerate a tiny bit to put our uh, periapsis into the atmosphere, detach the fuel tanks, and then push our ap push our periapsis back up to a safe height for our second burn that would get us all the way to Joule. The other way I thought we could do something like this, what we're doing now, but make sure we put ourselves on a Joule collision course, then detach the fuel tanks and do a correction burn so we're not going to crash into Joule. Or the way I w eventually end up going with, which was just going to Lathe, get on a collision course with Lathe, and then detach them. So we're going to be crashing them into Lathe. Probably not the smartest thing to do, to be honest, because... We don't want to be contaminating Lathe with Kerbin technology. Uh, for those who don't know, the Cassini probe that was crashed into Saturn was deliberately crashed into Saturn, not only so we could actually learn about Saturn, but also because it, we, we wouldn't want to contaminate any potential uh, alien life on its moons with human bacteria or something like that. Have you ever seen the, the film War of the Worlds? The biggest um, spoiler alert for War of the Worlds. I say the film, it's not, it is more than just a film, but I guess that's how a lot of people know it these days. Uh, the thing that killed the aliens in that film is the fact that they didn't have the immune system, the immunity required to survive on Earth's, with Earth's bacteria and stuff like that. So, didn't wanna, we didn't want to do a, I was going to say we shouldn't have done a similar thing here. Who cares? I guess Kerbal's just had really clean stuff, so it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> and besides, when things explode in Kerbal Space Program, there is absolutely zero debris, unlike in reality. So I suppose it didn't really matter either way. But I do concede that it was somewhat strange planning that out of all three options, only one of them would have the most unrealistic profile and that we're contaminating um, a celestial body, and that's the one I ended up going with. Although, to be fair, it's all irrelevant because we are actually sending down massive colony structures and it's not like we haven't visited Lathe before anyway so all of this was just some giant moot point anyway so our orbital trajectory is not ideal ideally we'd be coming in at exactly the same sort of angle as the orbiting station as, as well but it was not too much of a problem to be honest at the end of the day we're going to be a stationary object on the surface of Lathe so even if our orbit was perfectly aligned to the orbiting station when we actually land we're going to go out of sync anyway so as long as we're kind of landing somewhere that at some point lands that is like directly below the orbiting station we're fine 
as present there is currently no way of getting kerbals to and from the surface base and the colony and indeed between the surface colony and the ocean base that's going to be may, pro probably going to be the next thing we have to do in this series is send some sort of system down to transport transport kerbals between the three bases those three bases being the surface colony on the land the surface colony on the ocean and of course the orbiting colony around lathe and possibly some sort of transport system so kerbals can transfer between the orbiting colony around lathe to the big colony that's orbiting jewel uh, the jewel one space station so there go the there goes what well, a while ago now there went the uh, auxiliary fuel tanks and the nose cone because obviously we don't need them anymore and we're now well and truly on a proper collision course they are not going to get left floating around in space and then we can just continue with the last of our descent we have loads and loads of delta v so we can select a nice landing site without needing to worry too much about how much fuel we have left one of the challenges of lathe is obviously that most of it is ocean usually when i'm doing surface bases i don't really think too hard about where i'm putting them with the exception of maybe the base i sent to the mohol and the base i sent to the dres canyon because usually you can just aim and you'll just land on the surface and it's pretty much a guarantee if you want to land on a flat bit just choose a biome like lowlands or something where there isn't much altitude changes Lathe's a bit of a different story not only is the land very few and far between but most of the land is quite rocky and uneven as, as well and while you know it's it's possible to land on an uneven surface it would be nice to land somewhere relatively flat i thought this island here looks pretty interesting it has some interesting geographical uh, features geological features it's got a weird sort of shape there's a little lake on it might be an interesting spot to uh, place our colony so that's what we're going to do we're going to do a quick maneuver node burn to get ourselves on a collision course um i would probably recommend using the mod trajectories or is, it, is that what it's called landing trajectory i'm sure if you google this term it will come up where it tells you where you will actually land once the atmosphere has slowed you down sufficiently i like to keep this as trying as stock as close to stock as possible with the exception of kerbal engineer redux and of course my graphics mod just to make them as easy to emulate as possible especially for people like console players who can't mod their game uh, so I just did the bit of, I did a bit of trial and error, I'm not gonna lie, I did some F5 and F9ing to get ourselves in a place, landing in a place that I liked. Didn't take too long though, and obviously because of Lace's thick atmosphere we can use parachutes to do the bulk of our descent and our slowing down, and those uh, heat shields will be providing a lot of drag as well, although we don't want to be landing with those attached, so as soon as our parachutes open we can detach them. If we detach them before our chutes open, they'll end up smashing straight into the bottom of the co of the surface base and destroying parts of it. But once the parachutes deploy, our descent is slow enough that once we detach the heat shields, they will fall at a faster rate. So we have those aero spikes there just for the last of the landing because we're not going as slow as I would like. I'd ideally be like I'd like to be going just below four meters per second vertical speed. So 3.5 ish should be a nice safe bet. And as you can see, nothing was destroyed. The landing went nice and smoothly. So nothing more to say other than do a quick visual inspection and also a physical inspection by hitting F3 to ensure that nothing was destroyed upon impact. And then we can do some nice little cinematic shots of things firing up. So we got the scanner deployed, the giant communications arrays on that central tower are deployed. They're again built primarily for the aesthetics. We only actually need one of those satellite dishes to do the job. It is fine. And this thing should be, in theory, able to communicate with the dual satellite network, of which only consists of two satellites and a space station, to be fair. But now we have the orbiting station. Should be fine. So this thing should, in theory, almost always be able to contact the Kerbal Space Center. Speaking of the uh, orbital colony, we can uh, skip to that now and get ourselves ready to put some Kerbals into the oceans. Unlike the surface colony, as in the land-based colony, uh, this one will actually have some Kerbals in it. We're going to send Jebediah, Bob and Bill uh, and Val down to the surface of Lathe's ocean because you need a good pilot to land something as cumbersome as this and Jebediah is as good as they come. So as you can see, we still have this big skeletal structure attached to the ocean base, which is going to provide the actual engine thrust necessary to deorbit ourselves. But then we can detach it, let it get destroyed in the atmosphere and leave us with just the ocean base uh, for the landing itself. In terms of the landing site, I wanted it to be fairly relatively close to the land colony just because makes the uh, makes commuting between the two far less time consuming and arduous and I guess it's just nice to have things close by. They can wave at each other and ensure that they are that each respective colony is doing okay. They can do a little thumbs up each morning. That's the uh, 
the way in which these communals are gonna these kerbals are gonna communicate. So uh, yeah. So again, just creating a maneuver node to uh, set up a rough trajectory. Obviously, bearing in mind that we're going to be uh, ending up somewhere just short of where that blue line terminates because the atmosphere is going to kill off quite a lot of speed for us. And we don't have as much delta V in our engine stage as we did the land base, but it doesn't really matter because we don't have to do very much burning at all to get our periapsis into the atmosphere. And besides, we can't do a very aggressive entry uh, anyway because of the fact that we don't have any heat shields on this base. It won't matter too much because the parts that are going to be facing the, the brunt of the re-entry heating are not particularly... Uh, vulnerable to the effects of heating but regardless they're not uh, completely indestructible at least in the same way that the heat shields are so just as well really so again most of my surface bases have this same sort of structure of just a central tower and then four or any other number i guess surrounding that tower this is one of the things i think would be nice for kerbal space Program to maybe implement is that those laboratories are very very hard to naturally integrate into bases and things like that because their guts are um, vertical they're not horizontal it'd be kind of cool to toggle if you want to have the lab in a horizontal configuration or a vertical configuration because for space stations it's irrelevant right because there's no gravity well, I say no gravity. There's gravity in space, obviously, but it's microgravity, so their curves will be weightless. It's irrelevant which way up and down it is. But on surface bases, I always find it's far more, uh, it's far easier to naturally integrate that lab in a horizontal position. So it'd be kind of nice if you could have like you could toggle which what, what kind of IVA setup it has if you have it in a vertical or horizontal setup. But I suppose it's only a minor point, really, and you could just pretend. <laughs> you could just use your imagination to pretend it's not like that. Certainly, that's what I have to do for my mobile bases, where vertical structures really are not really that possible. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a good... I didn't really like the landing site that I would have if I were to land this thing on the daylight side of the moon. So, unfortunately, we'll have to be landing it at night, which is not a big problem for, like, the game. But for the viewers, if it, and I guess for me playing it, you can't see anything. So we will unfortunately be landing at night, but when we've splashed down, which will be happening uh, momentarily, I'll quickly time warp it to daytime so you can get a good look at this thing, good and proper, sitting majestically onto the surface. And there is our splash down there. And it looks like everything survived. And we can hit F3, like I said earlier, just to make sure that everything was fine. Those uh, destruction messages were for the actual transfer stage that we ended up ditching with the intent of destroying anyway, so it's not a big deal. And there it is, bobbing about. We can quickly time warp to day and get a good look at this thing in the sunlight. So we can initiate our, our first scans of the ocean, see what it's made of, see what things, see what kind of data we can get through. We actually have a Capola observation module sitting underneath the water, um, just below, so we can get some kind of close-up looking at it. I guess that won't tell us much because we can see it from all the other angles as well but regardless it it gets us one step closer uh, so there we go there's a little panning shot and we can zoom out and go to the exit screen now so i hope you enjoyed this installment i have been a bit bunged up this week so sorry if um my voice has sounded a bit weird hopefully it wasn't too noticeable i mean if it wasn't i've now drawn attention to it so whoops <laughs> on screen there are links to more videos if you want to watch more videos like this as well as a link to subscribe and uh, to support me on patreon there are also links to my discord and my twitter in the description as well as my merchandise and instagram all that good stuff i will see you in the next one uh, goodbye <laughs>